for now, we're going to bring on our guest of the evening, and that's going to be Julie Dobbs from 97.1 The Freak. Julie, thank you so much for joining. How are you? Yeah. Hi, April. I'm doing great. Thanks. How are you? Uh, I'm great. I'm great. I was telling Julie earlier today, I was like, hey, I don't want to ask you any questions until we're on the show so we can have like this real like candid conversation. So I'm going to be hearing about her journey through breast cancer at the same time as you guys. So I'm really excited to, to learn all there is to know about about what you went through. Um, I want to give a yeah. f- real quick shout out to a few people who are watching right now. Leanne's in the house, Linda, Max, and Annette. Everybody be sure and pop any questions you might have for Julie in the comments and we will definitely share those with her. So, all right, here we go. I want to know how this all began. How did you first realize you had breast cancer? Yeah. Um, so I was 28 years old. Um, I'm actually coming up on the 10 year anniversary of my diagnosis, um, which was like the end of September, 2013. So doing the math that makes me 38 now. Um, and yeah, 28 years old when I was diagnosed and it came completely out of nowhere Um, I didn't have a family history of breast cancer. It was not on my radar at all. You know, you hear that you don't even need to really worry about doing mammograms or anything until you're 35, sometimes 40, whatever it is that they tell you. I was far away from that because I was just 28 years old. Um, And mine was a different kind of breast cancer. It was inflammatory breast cancer. So it presented like an infection. Uh, so I, I could physically see it and feel it. So it was a little bit different than, you know, just finding a lump or, or something like that, where you kind of have to dig around and then, you know, find the lump. And that's kind of what you hear that you need to be looking for. Um, mine was different. It looked like an infection. It was, um, on my right breast and it was, all, it looked like a big rash basically. And it was hurting. Um, so I went to the doctor, I just went to my gynecologist and he said, you know, this looks like a normal, like infection. I think he said it could be mastitis, you know, which I later come to find out that's like what people get a lot of times from breastfeeding. Um, he said, it, it could be that I'm just going to give you this antibiotic and it should take care of it. And I kind of pressed, I was like, are you sure? you know, this seems really, I don't know, this is something like I've, I've never experienced, never seen. And he said, well, if you really want, we could do a biopsy. So I was like, Oh, okay. You said the biopsy word. Um, that's a little bit frightening. And then he said, I I wanted to interject one thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm so glad, like, well, it sounds weird to say this. You're okay. So we can say it now, but I'm glad that you're sharing the story because inflammatory breast cancer isn't super common and yeah. that's one thing people don't think is that it could actually be visible like that right. and inflammatory breast cancer is super scary it's very aggressive and it's so fortunate that you caught it early and in fact after we finish talking tonight I'm going to play a little piece from um, Dr. Joyce O'Shaughnessy who talks about the different ways inflammatory breast cancer can present itself. But okay, we're back to you and keep going on your story there. I just want to throw that yeah. in there. It's awesome. I know Dr. O'Shaughnessy, my doctor was in her group, actually. Dr. Osborne is my doctor. Yeah, Dr. O'Shaughnessy uh, was my doctor. So very Okay, cool. great. Yeah. 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 They're they're just awesome. They're amazing. Um yeah. So so um I he's the doctor at that time said the word biopsy and said, you know, it'll be a couple of weeks till we can get you in. And at that point I was like kind of freaked out. It's like, if I'm going to be getting a biopsy, I definitely don't want to wait two to three weeks, especially while like I have all this going on here, you know, it's just going to get worse. If it is something like that, it's just going to get worse in two to three weeks. So, um, he referred me to another surgeon at Baylor and I called her, I spoke with her nurse and I say she was the first angel that I had on this journey. I'm sure you might've experienced this too. And anybody who's been through this probably had, had some interactions with angels along the way that really, absolutely. Helped, yeah. That really helped them knew what to say, knew what to do. Right. Um, and so the, the nurse that I called that I spoke with on the phone, I explained it to her. I told her what was happening and she said, okay, I'm going to get you in tomorrow. So she got me in the next day and we did the biopsy, which really hurts by the way. 
<laughs> so which kind of yeah painful. which which kind of biopsy was it was it the core needle biopsy or how did they yes. do your biopsy yeah dude yeah i'm totally feeling you on that it's yeah. totally painful it yeah. hurt like that was one of the things that hurt the most out of all of this it was like yeah yeah that and you know like the the port and anyway um so so that nurse got me in quickly they did the biopsy i found out like you know the next day that it was breast cancer so it was that it was that surgeon that i had initially called she sat me in the doctor's office and i was with my mom and we went in there just thinking fully expecting it to be nothing right and just like okay yeah they're right this is an infection this is what you need to do and she said those words you have breast cancer and it was you know, you just kind of black out. <laughs> oh yeah. It's and... like everybody's voice turns to Charlie Brown teachers. I mean, like exactly. Instantly. You're um, like, it's an out of body experience. And yeah. yeah, I was, it was, it was crazy for me at that time. I was, you know, I was dating who's my, my husband now, but we were just dating. I was really focused on my career and, um, hanging out, you know, going to all my friends, like bachelorette parties. I was just in one, the, the pr prior weekend in Florida, just having fun, like not a care in the world. And then you get hit with that bomb and, and it's so life changing. Absolutely. It is absolutely. For those of you just joining, we got Julie Dobbs here from 97.1, the freak breast cancer survivor diagnosed at 28 freaking crazy. And a reminder that you guys can drop any questions in to the chat below. So you're diagnosed, you're trying to just absorb that. Yeah. And you did the biopsy. At what point were they able to stage you? So I don't know if this was just like my doctor or, or, or what, but they didn't necessarily give me a stage probably because they didn't want to freak me out, I'm guessing. Um, but with my, you know, with it being inflammatory, it was also triple negative. Um, so it was triple negative inflammatory. And by this point, it wasn't super early on right. because the tumor at that point was like basically the size of my fist. Wow. So it had been growing in there for yeah. a while. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I was, I was definitely like a stage three ish, at least like, <laughs> um, at that point. So they never really said that, but you know, I, I could definitely tell that that's, that's kind of what they were thinking it was it wasn't good yeah that's terrifying um yeah. and just so you know like i said we were going to have this conversation and be candid because we haven't talked about your journey and i was triple negative also um, oh you were I, I was stage one though um so mm -hmm. to have triple negative breast cancer and inflammatory breast cancer i don't know if i've ever spoken to anyone who had both of those julie that's yeah. just amazing and and almost unheard of as far as I'm concerned and I've talked to a lot of breast cancer survivors. So that's, that is really crazy. And this is 10 years later. We're talking uh, that you, that you've, that you're here. I mean, come on. This yep. is so cool. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I yeah. know. Okay. It's so amazing. they didn't stage you at that point, but you said that the tumor was quite large and you didn't feel this tumor at any point, right? You just saw something on your, on like visible that you had checked out. Yeah, it was visible and it was painful. Like I lived with my, my boyfriend at the time. And I remember like, honestly, it was like silly. He was walking by me and kind of like slapped at me, like joking, like, like in my chest area. And I was like, Oh, why did like, ouch. And he's like, why did that hurt? I was like, I don't know. And that like at that moment is when I realized that something was going on there, but yeah, it, yeah. it, it looked like, you know, yeah. It, it was very visible yeah. and it hurt to the touch. Wow. Um, you know, what's funny, Julie, is I've talked to so many people who have realized that they have a problem by like their dog, like stepping on their chest or like they yeah. ran into the wall or whatever. And they felt that area, like just real happenstance, coincidental kind of things. And I'm just like, man, somebody's at work here. Like there's you know, somebody steering us to, to find these things. And right. I think that's so interesting that that's such a common way that this happens. Was it also like warm to the touch? I've heard that sometimes inflammatory breast cancer can be. Yeah, I think it was now that you mention it, it was, it was warm to the touch and there was like a little, this part's like gross. So I don't always just, you know, tell everybody, but like there was discharge, like coming out of my 
breast. So no, yeah. that was, that was like a very clear red yeah. flag. I think at that point, like right. this is weird what's happening. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was warm. It was, it was painful. And, and then obviously the discharge thing, it was like, right. Something's no, up here. I, I think it's important for you to yeah. share as much as you're comfortable sharing, because that's the thing is not, not everybody knows that not everybody yeah. knows to, to look for visible uh, signs to, for discharge or, or warm to the touch, all those different things. And that's why we want to share your story and for everyone's sure. story is so that people yeah. know what to look for. Right. I always say knowledge is power, you know, yes. like if knowledge is power. The more, you know, the more, you know, to look out for any of the testing that you can do preliminary testing, you know, any of it, getting your labs done. If you have an elevated level of this or that, it's like, well, let's figure this out. Why? <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's, I'm happy to share, you know, any and all of my journey to try and help other people. Yeah. We thankful that you're doing that too. All right. So we got you here and you, and you're, and you've got this large tumor. So did, what was the first thing they wanted to do? Did they want to do treatment or did they want to do surgery? What was the first thing that, how'd they want to attack this? Um, they wanted to attack it as aggressively as they could. And that was going to be with chemo first. So I started chemo, like, I think the following week, I think I maybe was diagnosed Friday and I managed to start chemo like Monday or Tuesday, the following wow. week. Yeah. And it was a, a aggressive, you know, treatment and aggressive concoction of the drugs. I had the red devil, um, that I'm sure you've heard about, um, and I did, I want to say it was eight rounds of chemo, like every other week I was doing the chemo. Um, and so, and I lost, you know, lost all of my hair. I tried to explore the cold cap situation. And I had a nurse at the time that was like, it's just like, this. it's not I think worth it. Got, kind of thing. I think they've gotten a lot better, but yeah, yeah, it wasn't worth it. She was like, your hair, you're not going to have much hair left. Like at this point, like as much trouble and the cost and everything, it's not going to make it you know, it's not going to keep enough of your hair to where it will matter. But that was something I was really struggling with, like yeah. being 28 and and working. I worked on television at that point. I'm on radio now, but I did TV for uh, like 12, 13 years. So, um, you know, it's like I was dating and I was on TV. I have to have hair. <laughs> yeah, so, totally. And for, for me, that was one of the hardest parts because I could go through life and people wouldn't know what I was battling if I had, if I looked normal. Right. But when you lose all your hair, it's like, then everybody knows, and then you got to talk about it and then you got to answer questions. And so I was, I was really fighting that whole aspect of it. And I was able to get a, a wig that was like permanently put on and it was fine. You know, I, I looking back, it didn't look as bad as I thought it did in the pictures and everything, but, but yeah, I, I lost all my hair through the chemo. Um, and then after the eight rounds of chemo, uh, they scheduled a mastectomy, a double mastectomy. They recommended, you know, doing both. So, uh, it turns out I, this is another important detail is that I had, uh, the BRCA one gene. So, oh, wow. I'm glad you got yeah. tested that, that office yes. is really great about making sure that everyone gets genetic testing. So I'm so glad you did that. Yes. And I think just with my case being 28 years old, they're like, we've got to figure out why, <laughs> like, why did this happen? So, um, they wanted did, to know I did that early on the testing. Um, yeah. did you, did you have any cancer in your family prior that you were aware of? No. So no, I mean, my mom never had it, but turns out she was positive for the gene too. Wow. She didn't, she didn't know she had yeah. it until I had breast cancer. And then she went and got tested and she was like, Oh my gosh, I have this gene too. So you got it from me. And I remember even saying at that time, like, okay, well, at least now, you know, and if I have to kind of go through all of this and, and fight this battle or whatever, like now, you know, that you need to look out for it too. And I'm happy to, to fight that fight, to give you that knowledge. Right. And yeah, she was totally. my number one person along with me for the ride. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so turns out I, I got the gene from her and I think she had, um, like a cousin, her dad's niece. So my mom's cousin, I think had, had breast cancer as you know, she was probably mid fifties or something when she had it. So that's the only person in our family that had had breast cancer. And that was just like a, like a distant cousin that 
my mom hadn't kept up with really. And she, it was almost like a, oh yeah, you know, now that I think about it, I think she did have breast cancer. So um, it's just kind of crazy how that works out. Yeah, it is. It is real crazy. And the thing is, is another good point is even if you don't have a lot of cancer in your family, you always got to be on the, on the lookout. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was kind of similar for me. Uh, my dad actually has prostate cancer and has had skin cancer and there's a lot of cancer in his family. And when I did the genetic testing, we figured all that out. You probably did the little family tree as well, maybe yeah. where you kind of look through to see who all had it, but it's so important just to stay in tune with your body and make sure that you're watching out for anything that might, might crop up. So one of the places you left off at was uh, you were just saying that you had a double mastectomy. Mm -hmm. um, so that, so you did the chemo, uh, you had the double mastectomy. Um, did you do reconstruction? I did. Yeah, I did the, the chemo. I had a double mastectomy. We just figured I, my doctor was like, you know, they're a pair. So why don't we just do them both and treat them as a pair? And because I had the genetic mutation, there was obviously a high chance that I could have something happen on the other side. Um, so I had both, both breasts removed and then did reconstruction. So they put in the expanders, um, I guess I don't, I'm trying to remember. I don't think they could, no, they couldn't do it during the surgery for whatever reason. So that was like another surgery to do the expanders. And then they pump those up that hurts. <laughs> and then you <laughs> finally get like the implants and all that. Right. And I actually, I mean, I've had like three or four surgeries since then that are just like touch wow. up surgeries, you yeah. know, trying to yeah. keep things looking okay. Yeah. Um, as you get older and everything else, but yeah, so I did the I did the double mastectomy with reconstruction. Um, and then I did radiation after that. So basically everything they could throw at it, they did. And, and we did. Wow. I'll say, wow. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. So how did you feel about the mastectomy? Um, and how do you feel about it now? How did that affect you? Um, I, oh gosh, that was a bad surgery. Um, I just, I mean, they did a fine job, but it's just a, like mentally, it's a really tough one, uh, because you're going through so much at that time. And it's like, yeah, you know, like basically what's happening is they're cutting off your boobs. Right. <laughs> so it's like, right. It's, right. Just, it's just scary. They're, they're amputating a part of your body. You're yes, getting an amputation like a part of your body yeah, that yeah. is important to you. Yeah. Um, and so you go in and so there's a lot of buildup trying to think about what's going to happen. And then the recovery is really painful and you're mentally just like sad and scared and kind of like going into a little bit of a depression and, at my age at 28, there's not many people I could talk to about any of it, you know, like my friends are in a whole nother world. And, um, so it was, it was tough. It was really tough. I was very thankful. I had my, my boyfriend who's now my husband and uh, my mom, they were like right there with me every step of the way. Cause you do, you need a lot of help. And, um, I had a couple of good girlfriends who were really, really good to me. Um, but yeah, that surgery was, was bad. The good part came not long after because, um, at the surgery, you know, obviously they're removing everything and then they go run it all through the, t the labs and the testing. And I was, I got the call from my doctor that there was no evidence of disease with all of the tissue that they had removed. So the chemo that the very strong, aggressive, you know, chemo that we did had basically taken that tumor that was this size and just completely shrunk it. I knew it was shrinking and I knew it seemed to be working, you know, yeah. but I didn't know that there was nothing left. So I just wow. have like, just my, that doc, my doctor, Dr. Osborne, I just have, I mean, the utmost, like just respect and gratitude to her for, cause she was on the cutting edge of like research and she was always going to conferences and figuring this out and that out. And this is these two drugs. And she just like, whatever she did, just wiped it all out. Um, which is amazing. And I'm so grateful to this day, but, but yeah, so I got that call and then they still wanted to do the radiation afterwards. So that was more wow. just like another safe measure. Yeah. Yeah. I have to plug in all these little things that, that come up when we're talking. Cause I'm like, you know, we haven't had a, a chance to really dig into a lot of stuff but we actually donate to the research and trials at Baylor. So oh, cool. that's really cool that, that you were a part of that. So that's uh, something we've been contributing to uh, since yeah. 2014. So really that's happy awesome. about that's that. A great but cause. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Um, and then, so one thing I wanted to ask you about chemo, because 
I've talked about it a lot. Like a bunch of weird stuff happens when you're on chemo that people don't really talk about that much. Like there's a neuropathy, there's, you know, your fingers, your fingernails change colors. Um, like I remember my, the bottom of my feet, my feet were peeling away. Um, just a lot of strange mm-hmm. stuff like that. What kind of, I, I like to talk about it because people don't know. And like, I was just like, I never heard of any of this. And so that's why I like to talk about it is see if you had any strange things happen that, that were unexpected for you when you're going through chemo specifically. Yeah. I definitely remember a little bit of the neuropathy, um, but nothing too strange. Obviously losing your eyebrows is weird. <laughs> like, oh my God. Like I know like, is one thing. Yeah. But eyebrows. It's like, ah, oh like, yeah. There, there was that movie called, I think powder or something. And the yes. guy was like, you don't know talk about, that's what I felt yeah. like I look like. And like, yeah. Like, like your eyebrows and your eyelashes and your nose hairs. That was the weirdest part. I was the like, hairs. Wow. Yep. yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. So that crazy. part was really weird. Um, I remember I was, I was taking like a a lot of nausea stuff to try and help. And I remember like the first one hit me pretty hard and I was down for a while and I got kind of sick. But after that, I was able to keep working and I didn't feel too terrible. And, you know, you're changing your diet and doing everything that they're saying and telling you to do. But I remember for me, like like working and getting out and having plans was so important because the last thing I wanted like was to go be going through chemo and then just be sitting around at home and like kind of having a woe is me party like that was not that was not what I wanted and and so I I did I just kept you know going on with my normal day to day and I think that really helped me a lot mentally through the chemo and everything. Yeah. Else. So strong. And I know, I know how tired chemo makes you. So that's a big deal, you know, to be able to, yeah. to continue to go out for those of you who just joining, we have Julie jobs here, Julie Dobbs here from 97.1, the freak. And she's a breast cancer survivor diagnosed at 28, which is now 10 years ago, inflammatory breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer. The Man, rarest of rare and aggressive stuff going on. I've got questions coming in, and I I do I don't want to forget to come back to your radiation, but I'm going to ask mm-hmm. a few of these questions since there are, a lot of them are on topic right now. So one of the questions someone had here is, when are they telling you to have your implants replaced? Um, you know they haven't said anything about that to this point. Um, I've had, like I said, a couple of the the touch-up surgeries, the fat grafting surgeries, and my plastic surgeon hasn't said anything about the implants. I know they'll say like 10 to 15 years-ish, so probably coming up on that before too long. Um, Okay, no, now this is, so I don't know if this happens to you, but I black out on a lot of this stuff and kind of forget. Oh, yeah. But I I just had, it just popped into my mind, so I I've had a lot of surgeries and I kind of lost track. But one of them was because of the implant that they put in um, at the time, which I think was the silicone, um, it, it had, it popped a little bit (laughs) and, and they, there was also like a recall on that particular, (laughs) it's like the car recall. It was, yes, it was like, like, it was terrible. They were telling people, if you have these implants to get them removed, um, and mine had popped. So now that I mention it, I had had, I have had them replaced because of that. So we replaced both of them. Um, and I think we went to saline. Now I could be saying these backwards, but yeah, um, the silicone ones I had, I had taken out and then replaced. So I think that I get to start over now with, you know, my countdown or whatever. So now I've had another like 10 years, hopefully. You got a fresh point. pair and you're good. Yeah, I got home. a fresh pair. <laughs> Always um, fun. And that's a is here. She's also a breast cancer survivor and, um, she says, did they take your lip nose? She wants to ask that. Yes. Um, I think that I had about 12 lymph nodes removed um, because the cancer had spread to my lymph nodes. Um, so, yeah. And honestly, like to this day, that is this area where the lymph nodes were removed, like is still, I still feel it. it's still numb. I don't really feel anything under here. Like there's a kind of a weird, like, big crevice in my arm. Like it kind of hurts sometimes to stretch my arm out all the way. And I don't know if that's because of the lymph node removal or not, but that like this area where those lymph nodes were removed is the 
what I kind of feel and deal with still uh, the most 10 years later is that area. Wow. Interesting. I, I yeah. just had a few removed, so I didn't have a, a lot. Are you, are you dealing with any issues, you know, any swelling in your arms or anything like that? No, I don't think so. I know. I mean, I, I have that like sleeve that I'm supposed to wear a lot, or I guess for traveling and flying and that kind of thing. So I try to do that. Um, but no, so far so good. I haven't had to deal That's with that. I know lymphedema is like the big fear, right? Yeah. And, um, we had a doctor on the show who um, has an organization that helps folks who have lymphedema. So if that ever does crop up, be sure and reach out and I can help okay. you up. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, want to mention that Kim Lusk is in the house. She's also a breast cancer survivor. She's going through treatment right now and she is awesome. She's a true warrior. And she says, uh, losing your nose hair is weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True it's a weird story. Okay. Now that, now that I, think about that it's like I, there was you don't realize like how your nose hairs help when you have a cold yeah <laughs> Cause cause like there's if, nothing if to stop it nipples, man. It's just, yeah. it just it just runs yeah. right out gets everything on your face yeah. it's lovely yeah it's so crazy. lovely I, yeah. I have to say though, the, I did enjoy not having to shave at all, or yeah. not having to worry about facial hair or anything like that. That part was nice, and I remember my skin was so so soft, and I just sort of, I don't know, I kind of gravitated to the positive aspects of that. I was just like, this is nice, you know. I can yeah get ready. You have quick to find the positives the in the whole yeah. thing. You really do. Totally. We got a question here. Uh, Max asks. And you kind of already alluded to this, but I'll ask another question. You said that you were able to keep working through your treatments, but did you ever have to take any time off at all? Like even just for your treatment itself? Yeah. I mean, definitely for the surgery um, and probably going to get the actual chemo. But at that point I was working, I was freelance. So I was doing reporting for Fox Sports Southwest and um, I kind of made my own schedule. So um, that helped, you know, I didn't have like amazing health insurance, like a full-time job would have given me, <laughs> but, um, but the freelance side of things really helped me to where I, I could kind of schedule my work around all of my treatments and, and everything like that. But yeah, I tried to, to work as much as possible. Well, that's so cool. Yeah. That you were able to do that. Yeah. Um, Kim Lusk, again, uh, the breast cancer survivors going through treatment right now says, how long did it take for your body to heal after the conclusion of your chemo? Um, the conclusion of my chemo, um, I guess I kind of quickly went into the surgery phase. So I kind of, it all blurs together for me, but for the chemo, I don't know. I mean, I, I did pretty well with it. Like, especially with the nausea and everything. The one thing that I know um, I was worried about specifically was getting pregnant afterwards because I was 28, I didn't have kids yet. And they were giving me those Lupron shots um, to try and like suppress my ovaries and protect them from the chemo. So that's the one thing I was really kind of worried about because I, I knew I wanted to have kids. Um, and um, I ended up, I didn't even mention this, but while I was going through chemo, my boyfriend proposed and, uh, like I was diagnosed in late September, he proposed in November, like when I was, you know, wearing a wig and everything wow. else. And then I had the, the chemo and then the surgery, and then we got married in June and I had radiation after that. Wow. Um, so I was able to like, the way it worked out was awesome to where I was just planning, basically trying to focus on planning a wedding and we had the wedding pretty quickly, but it gave me something like an end goal, it gave me something to focus on. And it was like, of course, I'm going to make it through this. I'm getting married. I have to, but just with that timeline too, I was real worried about my body not recovering um, from the chemo. And, uh, it, it turned, turned out that everything was okay. You know, I had, I went and saw a fertility doctor not long after we, I guess we were about to get married or had gotten married and we thought, well, okay, we know this is going to be probably difficult because of everything I've been through. So let's go talk to a fertility doctor. And she told me at that point, like, you know, you can, it looks like everything's okay. Like you're, ovaries are functioning like more of a 35 year old than a 28 year old or 29 year old at that point. So I knew it would be, you know, a little bit more difficult. And then, um, one month later I was pregnant. 
that's amazing really that's so, so cool. yeah so like right that's you know so, cool. so my like to answer your question long long winded answer to your question <laughs> no, is, I love it though. it seems like my body thankfully like recovered and I was able to get pregnant and have babies and and everything else. And really there, I, there weren't too many long lasting effects from the chemo. I say that, but I do think I have like fog brain still. It could be the chemo, it could be the kids. Oh, um, you got to hang on to that and use that as an excuse forever. Cause I still be, do. Exactly. It, it, it's like, tell oh, me I'm not supposed to use it anymore, but I do anyway. <laughs> right. Like, well, look, my keys in my car, it's chemo yeah. brain. They're like, Julie, oh. that was 10 years ago. I'm like, Hey, yeah. I worked hard for that excuse. Well, I mean, like, <laughs> seriously, I think it's more like a, a PTSD thing. Seriously. Yeah. Cause like I talked to Dr her O'Shaughnessy about it and she's like yeah the the chemo brain only really lasts for x amount of time so it's not very long you know yeah and I'm like come on man I, I want right. to use it so I, I, I think we should be able to after all we went through I think we should <laughs> too we deserve that yeah all right I got a couple more questions and don't let me forget to get back to your radiation but um Colin Jones wanted to say just wants to say hi to you beautiful warrior ladies thank you Colin so much man thank you that's nice. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Joseph Lee from Corpus Christi is in the house. He says, who was your biggest supporter spiritually through your process? More so at the beginning when you found out? That's his question. Um, let's see. The biggest leader spiritually. So I mentioned my mom and my boyfriend now husband. They were both there every step of the way. Somebody I haven't mentioned yet is my mother-in-law. Um, she had actually been through breast cancer, like just one year before me. Um, and she had beat it. Unfortunately, hers came back and she passed away, uh, coming up on four years ago, January, um, which is, I, I just absolutely loved her. But since she had been through it, not long before me, she was a really nice guiding light. She was very, she's just the most positive person. Um, and I owe a lot to her for just how she was able to, she came in town. She lives in, lived in Canada, um, came in town, helped me through it. And she was, I could really relate to her because she had just been through it. Um, and so she was probably my number one, you know, guiding light, I guess, through it all. And then I did, I did, I've always been somebody that likes going to church and stuff, but could I've just been busy and kind of distanced from it, but I did like a little Bible study with some of my friends and that really helped a lot. Um, so I would say that those things, just leaning on friends, family, and if you do, you know, pray, <laughs> praying and, and just as anything you can do to stay positive, those, those yeah. things were I, very important to me. I think it's, uh, one of the things that you mentioned is a, is a really good call out is, uh, you know, if you're recently diagnosed with breast cancer, kind of finding like a mentor, like what you mm -hmm. described, somebody who's been through breast cancer, had a similar ex experience or was diagnosed with something similar to you. I had a person in my life because um, when I was first diagnosed, I don't know if you experienced this. I was like, I need to find somebody who had triple negative breast cancer because everywhere online, it looks just so scary. Yep. And I was like, if I can't find anyone in my mind, I was like, they've all died. That's what yeah. I was thinking. And so when I found somebody who had been a survivor from triple negative breast cancer for several years, I just latched onto her. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and she was a great a great guide for for me as well. And speaking about the the spiritual piece, um, you know, whenever I was going through treatment, uh, somebody gave me a, a holding cross, and mm -hmm. that was really helpful for me uh, when I was going through treatment. Um, just to, to hold that and feel like I was kind of passing all the bad stuff to that cross and letting go of it. And yeah, um, yeah there's just a lot of, a lot of good things I think to take away from this conversation. So if you're newly diagnosed or going through breast cancer treatment right now, you know, maybe if you haven't found somebody reach out, we have our survivor group, uh, survivors rock, a breast cancer can stick it community. So many people in there ready to lift you up for that. Um, I want to make sure and get back. I'm going to take a break from some of the questions here. I will come back to you guys, I swear. Uh, but I really want to hear a little bit about the radiation. I myself didn't have radiation, so I'm always very curious to see how that went. And you said that you had it after your reconstruction. Is that right? Um, no, I I think that was part of the deal is that I had to wait for the radiation. Um, and then gotcha. they did the expanders. Um gotcha. Yeah. So it was, 
it was chemo and then surgery. And then I had my wedding and then, um, <laughs> we, we waited on our honeymoon so I could finish my radiation. Um, That's so crazy, man. I know. It's I impressive. Know. Like, I don't know many people who got married while they're going through yeah. treatment. That's pretty amazing. And it's a, it, it was a lot. I remember thinking like it had to be in the summer. My husband worked for the Dallas stars for 14 years on the oh, coaching cool. staff. So uh-huh. Anything we wanted to do had to be in the summer because of his schedule. So we were like, we're either going to do it this summer or next summer. And I was like, screw it. <laughs> I want to do it go. now. Yeah. I want to do it now. I want to have a big party. And it was like, our wedding was more than, you know, just a wedding. It was like a celebration of so much because I had, you know, gotten that cancer free kind of those heard those words or whatever, and just had a big party with all my friends and best thing and ever family. And it was yeah. great. But, um, but yeah, we did, I did the radiation after that. And that was, that was tough because it was every day. It was every day. I forget how long I did it, like three or four weeks, something like that. You know, you're supposed to go every day kind of at the same time. So I think going back to that work question, I, it was, I think, in the off season because I was covering the hockey team. Um, and so I didn't have as much work going on. But that was more just like, OK, here's my reminder every single day that I have to go back to this hospital and I have to see the doctors and I have to talk about this. And I just wanted to be done with it at that point. But um, for me, radiation wasn't too bad. You know, you get to know the people there because you see them every day and they make it. It was pretty quick. and. um you know, you just lay in that big machine and, and they draw little like spots of where they're targeting, I guess. And I still have, I think some of those markings on my stomach or on my chest. Um, but you know, it, I, and I think that I had to put something on cause it is, you do get like a little like sunburn feeling, you know? Um, but it, it wasn't terrible. And I was just, counting down the days till that was over because I knew that was like my last step in the process. Right. So did you feel that the radiation wasn't as bad as the chemo? Uh, yes, that would be correct. <laughs> yeah. The radiation was annoying, but it didn't really hurt or I, I didn't feel too sick from it. Luckily, uh, the chemo was definitely more of a, something that just got in the way, I guess, of your day to day because you weren't feeling a hundred percent. Right. Some somebody had a really great question here, and thank you for sharing all that, uh, Julie. That's that's yeah. good information. Like I said, it's uh, everybody's story is unique, and so being able to hear the details of what you went through is super helpful, especially those watching right now who are going through treatment and it's scared. Yeah. You know, it yeah, needs, needs sure. some hope. So it's really great that you're sharing this. Um, I did see a, a great question from Aquarius, who is recently out of treatment. Um, she's a drummer and a breast cancer survivor. She says, will you be getting your children tested for cancer genes? That is a good question. Yeah, I will. Um, I was told that my daughter, because I have the BRCA1 gene, that she has a 50% chance of having the gene, not a 50% chance of getting cancer, but 50% chance of having the gene. And then if she has the gene, I think it's like, however however much percent, um, that she might get it, but they told me now I should probably look into this. Cause I feel like things change, but she, they told me like to test her when she turned 18. It's funny because it's like, if it's a blood test, like, why couldn't I just do that now? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I remember <laughs> we asked this question of, um, Dr. O'Shaughnessy not that long ago. And I remember that she said uh-huh. older too, because there was someone on the show, um, who also had the gene, and she she asked that question for Dr. O. And I remember that they said it was later. And I want to say it was like 18, too. I'll have to go back yeah. and find it. But this was a conversation I had with her back in in March. But your point, man, the, everything does move so fast. Because, like, when I was diagnosed in 2010, there were only a few genes that they tested for uh, that related back to breast cancer. And now there's, like, 32. And there may even be more than that at this right. point. So it, I don't think it would hurt at all to check that out yeah. and, and see if they would allow that sooner. Cause I mean, like you said, knowledge is power, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Especially when it comes to the, the genetic stuff, you know? Yeah, totally. I think everyone should know if they have that gene or not like early well, did, on. Yeah, totally. Did they ever, I know with one of them, um, Dr. O'Shaughnessy, she said, if I had, yeah, I can't remember if it was one or two, um, that she was going to want to do like a hysterectomy too. 
Yeah. Um, but they that they want to do that. I mean, I know you wanted to have kids, and you did have kids, so clearly you I didn't did have, have a kids, hysterectomy. But and I had a hysterectomy um, just this last, just I guess it was February. I had a hysterectomy. Yeah. And it was um, that, I guess, recommended by them? So It was. Wow. Yeah, it was uh, because I still had high risk for ovarian cancer because of that yeah. gene. So, yeah. yeah, we wanted to wait and make sure we were done having kids. And we knew <laughs> we were like, two is it. We're good. <laughs> let's let's do this. <laughs> um, so I had the I had the hysterectomy. Basically, everything I ha- I can do, I've done to try and prevent any sort of recurrence for ovarian or breast cancer at this point. But yeah, that was another surgery that was you know, not super fun, but just part of the deal. Yeah, Julie, I, I'm so excited that, you know, everything turned out so well and you got pregnant, you had a couple of kids. I mean, because that had to be so yeah. scary to, to yeah. be so young and being diagnosed with something so aggressive and to be 10 years cancer-free. I know Dr. O'Shaughnessy told me that once I was eight years cancer-free from at least triple negative, that I'd be as likely to get breast cancer as if I had never had it is what she told me. Now, I don't know the, the, you know, how they look at it when you have inflammatory also, I don't know if that changes anything or whatever, but I would say, man, 10 years cancer free from that is freaking amazing. Yeah. Like, thank like you. You are such an inspiration to so many out there. And I'm so happy that we're getting to share your story. And I know that there's people that are out there that are scared and, you know, you're going to be a mentor to them even just if it's virtually, you know? Um, right, for so sure. Well, thank you awesome. for saying all that. Yeah, yeah. well, totally. What you're doing True. is really cool. Like I told you before we started recording, I was like, man, I wish I had something like this when I was going through it, <laughs> you know, like just something I could tune into and hear other people's stories. And, and I didn't have anything like that. So this is awesome what you're doing. Well, thank you. And, you know, I have, again, another situation where kind of try to turn a negative into a positive was when COVID happened, I was like, well, what are we going to do? Like, you know, what can we do? And so we started this broadcast. And at that time we were doing it every week because what else could we do? And so to be able to share so many stories that I've just heard from so many people that it, that it has been helpful. And so I'm, I'm really glad that, that you were able to do this with us. You know, one thing I always like to ask at the end, uh, when I speak with someone who's gone through breast cancer, um, Mm -hmm. I want to know, can you tell me what, like, what are the most positive things that you can think of that has come out of going through breast cancer? Can you think of something positive? Um, I remember at the time, um, well, okay. I have two, like going through it. The, the thing that I realized was just how good, I guess people are like how caring people are, how loving people are, how wonderful friends and family can be, how people were going out of their way to send flowers or do anything that they could. You know, I even had people like I hadn't talked to in like 10 years that would send a little treat or something. And so I, you kind of like take a step back and you're like, okay, wow, like there is so much good in this world. Um, that was my positive going through it. My positive now is, and I talk about this quite often, is just how it changes your whole perspective on life. It really does. Um, you know, you there's so many day-to-day things that you can be getting caught up in, uh, you know, just stuff that's frustrating, stuff that's annoying, petty things with a coworker or a friend or whatever. And now that I've been through this experience, I just, I don't even... I I always say like, just don't sweat the small stuff because it's all small stuff. None of that really matters. What matters is that you're here and that you're trying to, to, you know, see the good in, in every day and in every situation and in every person. And I think that honestly, like, I don't think I would have that same perspective if I hadn't been through all of this. So that's definitely the biggest positive for me. Wow. That's so beautifully stated, Julie. That's awesome. Yeah, Dan, I thanks. thank you so much for for joining us tonight. I I kept you about fifteen minutes longer than than we no had worries. planned. So, but uh, I I really enjoyed chatting with you. I know everybody in the broadcast who's watching enjoyed asking questions and hearing your answers to those. And like I said, this entire interview will be available forever up on our Facebook page, and we'll be posting it out to our YouTube channel here real soon as well, so everybody can check that out. But Julie, I hope we keep in touch, and I would love yes. to to chat with you again sometime soon. And and, you know, we Anytime. have a lot of volunteer opportunities. I'm just saying. 
<laughs> I bet. I bet. Sounds like y'all are busy. Well, we keep me in the busy. loop. I will, girl. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And of I hope course. you have a great, great to night. Meet you. Okay? You Thank too. you. Take you care. Too. Bye. Bye. All right, everybody. Give it up for Julie Dobbs. 97.1 The Freak. Breast cancer survivor. Diagnosed at 28. 10 years cancer free now. Man, so amazing. So grateful to have her on the show. Uh, man, let's see.